You know, compared to their friends across the channel, sometimes I think the French get a bit of the short end of the stick when talking about scientific and industrial history. If you take a look, though, as we will here today, at the Musée des Arts et Métiers in Paris, I hope you'll agree with me that the French have plenty to be proud of and clearly were very innovative. The Musée des Arts et Métiers is home to an amazing collection of scientific instruments, machines, models, early machine tools, and so much more. Born in revolution, its long history and role as a teaching institution repeatedly put it at the center of important moments in science and industry, and it has the oldest industrial and technological collection in the world. We'll take a look inside at some of the spectacular objects in the collections and the stories behind them. The Musée des Arts et Métiers, literally translated the Museum of Arts and Crafts, sits in Paris's third district, right at the city center. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you're a Yank like me and you hear arts and crafts, you're thinking maybe something you did as a kid. I think a more accurate translation for English-speaking ears would be industrial arts and trades, but that doesn't even entirely do it justice. Calling what we see today a museum is fair, but it's really so much more. When it was originally founded, it wasn't a museum at all. Yeah, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. The French Revolution is a vast, complicated subject, but that's not going to stop me from grossly simplifying it. As the monarchy fell to an uprising of the people, there was an urgency to move away from the old ways. The Enlightenment had given the people a sense that maybe there were new possibilities to how to run their lives, and the two primary ruling classes in the way, the monarchy and the church, had to go. The king had an unfortunate parting of ways with his head, and the church suffered greatly as well. Long seen as a source of corruption, they were kicked out of their positions of power and had to forfeit their buildings and land. Many were executed for their abuses. The people who came to power next were keen to advance science and reason and new ways of thinking wherever they could. Very conveniently, this beautiful medieval monastery was suddenly going unused, and it was an opportunity to use it for France's new premier institute for science and industrial learning. From all over France, and even the world, Scientific instruments, drawings, models, and full-size machines of every kind were brought together to educate and lead France to a more industrialized and prosperous future. France was indeed lacking Britain in the most important industry, textiles, the first industry to be widely industrialized, so this was a matter of great national importance. France had long enjoyed a very noteworthy community of scientists of all kinds, astronomers, navigators, physicists, agricultural scientists, and more. Additionally, skilled artisans like clockmakers, glass and ceramic workers, iron workers, and others made France famous the world over. And all that knowledge was brought here, in order to serve as sort of a national scientific and industrial think tank. From here it could be passed on to others and distributed throughout the country. Because of that history, this is not just a museum that was built upon objects collected for the purposes of creating a museum, but rather a museum that sprung from an incredibly rich collection that already existed from an institution designed for learning and teaching. And it got its start in 1794, so you can only imagine how rich the collections are. Parts of the museum are in portions of the original church completed as far back as 1135. To put 1135 into perspective, it would be 300 years before Leonardo da Vinci would be born. The same 300 years before Gutenberg would start printing books almost 650 years before the United States would declare independence, and almost 740 years before we'd start terrifying children with the coming of the robot revolution. The museum's collections are vast, and there's no way to give a comprehensive overview in a reasonable amount of time, so I'm going to focus on a few of my favorite objects and tell some of their stories. When you first come into the collections, you're in what's essentially the attic. I don't think this is some of the oldest parts, but these huge wooden beams have to be at least a few hundred years old. This area of the museum is the Scientific Instruments Collection, which is surely one of the finest I've seen. Everything here is first class. It's my understanding that many of the instruments were uh, acquired during the Revolution from the nobility, which I can only imagine was an awkward conversation. Knock, knock. We? Oui? Uh, hey, I understand you have some really cool scientific instruments that we'd love to have in our collections. Well, yes, I have some of the finest... Uh, I mean... See, it'd be a real shame if some of those things got lost. You know, like if something terrible happened to you. Oh, these dusty old things. Sure, back up your wagon and I'll help you load them. In the scientific instruments, the highlight for me are these mechanical calculators. They were invented by the brilliant French mathematician, physicist, and inventor Blaise Pascal. 
His father was a tax collector who had to manually do a lot of math, and at 20, Pascal set out to make a machine to simplify his dad's job. And after 50 prototypes and three years of work, he showed his calculators to the public, the very first mechanical calculator in the world. Pascal had figured out how to do something completely new, invent a mechanism which could automatically carry to the next column when necessary as you added or subtracted. Amazingly, this was in 1645. For his efforts, he was awarded a prize from the king in the equivalent of a very rare patent. Over the next 10 years, he would make 20 of them. Only nine are known to survive, with four of them being displayed right here, plus a clone made by somebody else. Today I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this cabinet, other than to say this is probably the most important few bits of metal and glass you've ever seen. The very first meter, kilogram, and liter. The distance, weight, and liquid measurement of almost everything around you can be traced directly back to these items, even if you measure in imperial units. If you watched my first video, which you totally should, you might have an idea why these are so important. I'm in awe just standing in front of them. I mean, the whole world has organized itself around these bits of metal and glass. I have an upcoming video which will tell the astounding story of how these came to be. Lavoisier was a brilliant chemist and is widely considered to be the father of modern chemistry. His accomplishments are too long to list here in totality, but you might have heard about his discoveries oxygen or hydrogen, or that he figured out water is composed of these gases, or how oxygen is an important component in combustion, or that he took the first stab at making something like a periodic table, or possibly his landmark achievement, showing how though matter may change form or shape, but its mass is always conserved. This completely changed how chemistry was understood and turned it into a quantitative science. He used this crazy solar furnace because it would generate huge amounts of heat with no contamination from combustion gases. He made a diamond burst into flames and recorded the weight of the glass container did not change. By the same process, he determined diamonds were made of the same thing as charcoal, carbon. He was way ahead in fashion as well. He worked with the best craftsmen of the day to construct extremely high-quality labware and instruments. And here in the museum, you can see some of the instruments he used in some of his most important experiments like these gasometers used to prove mass conservation. Lavoisier was part of the French nobility and involved in a tax farming company to collect taxes on behalf of the king. This netted him the funds to help him do his work, but did not make him very popular with some, even though he was working to try and make taxes more fair for the peasants. But he also used his money as a philanthropist and spent a great deal of his time and knowledge on researching public health issues from trying to improve street lighting, or how to purify public drinking water, or even improve conditions in prisons. He also pushed for public science education and put his money where his mouth was by funding a local high school focused on science education, and it's still going today. He also worked to improve the quality of tobacco when accounting by scientifically altering the tobacco and introducing a strict chain of custody through the sales. Despite this improving the system, it was deeply unpopular with those who profited by cheating, which was just about everybody. By all accounts, he was happily married to his also very gifted wife, Marie Anne. She was his laboratory companion, making drawings and meticulously recording experiments. But perhaps most importantly, she was fluent in several languages and could translate his results into English, and the English works of other scientists into French. She's known to have a full understanding of the science involved, and when translating, would make footnotes of the mistakes other scientists made. Because Lavoisier was part of the nobility, involved in text collecting on behalf of the king, and also what appeared to be altering tobacco. This put him squarely in the sights of a dark, paranoid period of the French Revolution called the Terror, when anyone with the slightest connection to the deposed king was highly suspect. There were also personal grudges to be settled from those whose shoddy scientific theories Lavoisier discredited. And in 1793, he was arrested with all tax collectors, and after a one-day trial declared guilty. And Lavoisier, at the age of 50, was guillotined and his body thrown into a common grave. Marie Anne's father was convicted of the same crime and killed the same day. The government confiscated Lavoisier's money and property, and Marie Anne was forced into bankruptcy.
During the revolution, one of his chemistry students fled to America. There he founded what is now the giant multi-billion dollar chemical company we know as DuPont. In 1956, the DuPont company acquired about 500 pieces of Lavoisier's lab equipment and donated it here to the museum where we see it today. I mentioned earlier this museum has models in it. I want to stress that these models were not created for the museum, but rather as teaching devices and later historical models for the students who came through here. And some of them are hundreds of years old. And some of these models had profound influences. Now, my apologies to the science historian James Burke. The BBC wants a fortune to license the clip in which James gives most of the following information. While well, I can't do it justice, allow me to humbly and poorly paraphrase. In 1725, there was a silk worker in the French city of Lyon, Basile Bouchon. His father worked on organs, and some of them had barrels with control pins, sort of like a music box, for automated control of the organ. This idea came from trip hammers long before that. The placement of the pins for controlling the organ was determined by a piece of paper. Bouchon realized the paper itself could be used as a control mechanism if he applied it to weaving machines directly. Because Asian-inspired fabrics with complicated patterns were all the rage, so automated weaving machines made a ton of sense. At the time, the job of controlling the patterns in the loom was done by children, and you can imagine the problems with that. So Bouchon devised a loom which the holes in the paper could allow pins to be pushed through or blocked, which then would trigger different threads to lift and create the patterns line by line. But the paper tore and it was difficult to use, and so the idea was abandoned. But later picked up by another Frenchman, Falcon, who improved the idea by replacing the paper with cards, which could be much better positioned and wouldn't tear so easily. Neither of these models were fully automated, though, and it still required a lot of manual work. Then in 1750, another Frenchman, Vaucasson, one of the greatest machine makers of all time, automated the entire process. He was then inspector for silk factories, and his version put the control mechanism on a drum instead of using cards. This would be automatically advanced in addition to automating the rest of the weaving process, thus greatly speeding up everything with a lot less human labor. Well, when the workers got wind, he was automating everything they feared for their jobs, and he was pelted with rocks and practically a riot broke out. So he retaliated by building a fully automatic loom driven by a donkey. And his machine is beautiful. Just look at it. For 1750, this is a fantastic marvel of mechanical engineering. The patterns it was able to make are beautiful, but because the drum could only have so many rows, it limited the complexity of the patterns. In the end, the workers won, and eventually Vaucasson's machines were moved here to the museum where they sat. Then, over 50 years later, in 1802, Napoleon placed a large order for silk from Lyon which couldn't be met without automation. Another Frenchman came here to the museum, studied the models, and put Falcon's cars together with Vaucasson's automation, and for that we know the machine by his name the Jacquard loom. And wow, what a success that was. Suddenly, complex patterns were cheap and easy to make, which completely changed the textile industry. Well, not in France, because during the Revolution, fancy patterns were disdained. But in England, this was picked up, and soon they were everywhere printing paisley and other patterns far faster and cheaper than ever before. Later, an American would take this punch card idea apply it to electromechanical counting machines used to process the 1880 census, and that company would later become the core of the company we now know as IBM. In the next video in our visit to the Musée des Arts at Métier, we'll cover more French innovation in science and industry. There's more amazing objects and stories to come. I can't wait to share them with you. I'll see you next time. In the video, I talk about Blaise Pascal's mechanical calculator without really getting the details of how it works. Over at the Mechanical Computing Channel, there's a great video on the internals and how each part worked, and how to do all the operations, and the video is really well done. If you have any interest in learning more, I highly suggest you check it out. Something curious is back then the French monetary system was not decimal and not everything worked out to units of 10, which must have made the math even more frustrating. Considering Pascal had nothing to look at for inspiration, it's really incredible how he put this together in the mid-1600s. I want to add a little more to the story of Lavoisier, 
particularly Marie Anne. There's some debate as to how much she was an assistant versus a collaborator. She was also a trained painter, and many of the drawings we saw earlier were hers. These came from the groundbreaking book Lavoisier published, considered to be the first real chemistry textbook ever. After Lavoisier's death, she was eventually able to recover all of his lab notebooks and, along with his contemporaries, published a compilation of his papers on the new discoveries in chemistry. The first draft reportedly had a bitter preface attacking those who killed him, but it was cut out before publication. She eventually remarried briefly, but always kept Lavoisier's last name, showing her undying devotion to him. She died suddenly in Paris at the age of 78. So, assistant or collaborator? I think the latter. <laughs>